Hey, it's Jim, and this is level three of the CFA program, the topic on portfolio management and wealth planning, and part one of risk management for individuals. For those of you who are tempted to think that this might be a dull recording on principles of insurance, let me go ahead and warn you that I don't believe that it will be dull. In fact, as evidence, let me point you to the authors of this particular reading. You should recall that in the professional standards, when we have conversations on conflicts of interest, and then especially back in level two, when we talked about operational risk in hiring third parties, we're supposed to uh, perform our due diligence to make sure that third party uh, has procedures and policies and protocols that are consistent with, with ours. Well, the four authors of this article, two of whom are certified financial planners, and those of you who know anything about the CFP designation know that there's an insurance planning module to that. And so these two guys are super experts in the insurance planning field, but they also hold the CFA charter, and a couple of them have, uh, have PhDs. So you have these four guys out there who are super talented in their fields. What they're doing is coming together and they are forming this risk management for individuals reading that has every applicability to the policy statement and everything that we have been talking about. So I'm not gonna go out on a limb and say that this is a super exciting one, but uh, not like derivatives or alternative investments, but clearly this is important for the Institute. And so we need to pay close attention to these LOSs. So there are the, uh, five or so that we'll do in part one, then we'll get the rest of them in part two. Let's go ahead and start with a brief recap like we often do. The very beginning of this reading defines this concept of life cycle finance, which uh, goes from you know essentially birth to death and how the life cycle and how wealth and risks and therefore portfolio management and risk planning varies with age. And so, of course, there are some exposures down there in the, in the blocks. Um, some of them we can worry about as standalone risks or hazards. Some are mutually exclusive. You know, for example, my father used to worry about dying too soon, premature death, and he also worried about outliving all of his capital. And I used to look at him and say, you know what, dude, just pick one, worry about one, don't worry about both, because they are mutually exclusive. All right, I'm guessing from your life cycle experience, you know all about life insurance and disability insurance and health insurance uh, and annuities, of course, you think about it this way. We have these physical assets, like a car, like a home, like our body. And what do we do? We use insurance as a risk management tool to help manage that risk. Sometimes we eliminate it. Sometimes we transfer it. Sometimes we reduce it. And then of course, annuities there are a part of all of these kinds of things, but mostly in particular to life insurance. So let's get uh, let's go right into the LOSs. Uh, characteristics of human capital and financial capital. Now, you know, after part two, I'm going to send you to the problems at the end of the reading. The very first problem at the end of this reading is a question that says something like, there's a client, is this client's human capital, is it greater than, is it equal to, or is it less than financial capital? So this is a very high probability, at least in my estimation, uh, to show up on the exam in some form uh, or another. And then I want to give you just a little personal thought here. Discuss the relationships among human capital, financial capital, and economic net worth. Notice, notice that the Institute is on top of the grammar there. My father was a big grammar guy. So it's between two and among three or more. So the Institute uses the appropriate term among uh, in its LOS. That's my uh, homework assignment for you. Make sure that when you're talking about three or more things, you use the word among. This is what you get from listening to Jim. Lots and lots of worthless stuff. <laughs> All right, how about the economic balance sheet? So this is virtually, almost virtually identical to the balance sheet that we've studied in financial statement analysis. But of course, instead of things like businesses have, which are, you know, 
cash and cash equivalents. We have those. We might have an inventory, but our inventory are things like a car and furniture and uh, golf clubs. And then we have long-term assets that are like, you know, uh, buildings and pieces of equipment and machinery. You know, we have a little bit of that kind of stuff, depending on how you want to divide it into short or long-term. But the big difference between the balance sheet as we look at it from an individual basis than the business basis is that we can separate this into human capital and financial capital. So here's a really good slide. In fact, it's probably worth it for you to get out your phones and take a picture of this. Uh, that LOS asks us to compare the characteristics. Well, here, here they are. So human capital, think of this up here in our brains, you know, what does that mean? We have the skill set and we can transform our brain work into our body work so that if we're working construction or working as a portfolio manager, how, whatever our client does, we need to consider future wages or earnings from those work related skills. Now, what I think is fascinating about this, and remember, I'm trying to make this not dull insurance kind of a conversation here, is that skip all the way down to, what is that, the fifth one? Yeah, stock-like or bond-like. Therefore, those future earning streams can be viewed as similar to interest payments from a fixed income security or dividend payments from an equity security. Human capital is a significant part of a working household's total wealth. Let me go ahead and give away that first answer on the question at the end of the reading. The correct answer is that the human capital is greater than financial capital because that's <clears throat> pretty much almost always the case. You know, you might be tempted to just not read the question stem and just put that as the correct answer, uh, but it might not be. So make sure you pay attention to the words up in the, up in the vignette. Uh, let's see. So we have these we have these interest like payments and these dividend like payments. So of course we can take the present value. And when we take the present value, we need some kind of an interest rate. We'll talk about what interest rate is relevant here in just a few minutes. Human capital, of course, varies based on prof profession and the labor market condition. So I want you to think about this this human capital at the micro level, which would be your the individual client and then expand that micro level out until you get to the macro economy. And that depends on things like, you know, what industry is the client working in? What is the exact profession? What does the labor market look like? What does uh, GDP look like? What do the politicians look like? All those kinds of things. So you can relate our unsystematic risk and systematic risk conversations from level one and level two and now level three to this idea of human capital. Financial capital, on the other hand, these are all the things that we are responsible for as a portfolio manager, as a manager of someone else's assets. They can be tangible, they can be intangible. We can divide them into different kinds of components. They can have different risk exposures. They can be current or non-current. Um, and of course, look at that bottom right there, uh, that financial capital that's going to help us determine the client's ability to take risk. The human capital, on the other hand, is going to contribute to the ability to take risk, but it's also give, going to give us an indication of the client's willingness to take risk. All right, human capital, net present value. What did I just say? Of course, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and compute a present value. We'll just call it, uh, we'll call it net present value. Notice what we're gonna do is we're gonna weight it by the probability of surviving to each future age. So you take a look at me, I'm 61 years old currently. What does that mean? What's my probability of making it to 62 years old? I don't know. I hope it's 99.9%, .9%, but that's why we rely on uh, the actuaries and their mortality tables because they can tell us on average when I'm going to die, but they can't tell me exactly when I'm going to die. But nevertheless, we come up with some kind of a probability. And what does that probability depend on? You know, it depends on probably my genetics. You know, my, my father died when he was 83. My mother died when she was 72. So I'm 61. Does that mean I'm going to die somewhere in between those two? Does it mean I'm going to die way out here or before that? 
Uh, you know, that's probably going to be given to us uh, in the problem. And remember the Institute, they don't want us to be actuaries. So we can ask somebody, it could be a third party, but it could be someone down, uh, down in the next office, what that probability might, might be. Here we go, a couple of sentences that I've said before, similar way to value stocks and bonds. We need a discount rate. And of course that, that discount rate has to be related to the risk associated with the numerator. Riskier employment requires a higher discount rate. That makes perfect sense. So here are some examples that, uh, that the Institute gives us. Investment managers, that makes sense, right? Startup entrepreneurs, race car drivers. Um, I, will, I will include dentists in there because dentists have high stress jobs. Uh, lower risk employment, you know, a government worker. Uh, how about this? How about a tenured college professor? It's always awesome for me to get back into the mathematics of stuff. So here we go. Human capital, there's an equation. Notice we have a summation from T equals one until uh, we're going to uh, retire, right? N is the retirement date. So that's probably an expected number, right? I'm 61, I'll probably teach for another, I don't know, six or seven or eight or 12 years, whatever it is. And then the numerator looks a little bit uh, intimidating, but it's clearly not. All we're doing is taking that little row there, that's probability. And then the W is going to be the employment in, uh, in that particular period, or at least the time period before, W T minus one, and then we're gonna multiply it by one plus the growth rate. Let me give you just a really quick example of the mathematics. And by the way, I have a really cool slide here that's coming up, but let's suppose that I make $100 today, and let's, let's suppose we wanna do this for three years, right? I'm gonna retire in three years. And let's suppose that for some reason I'm guaranteed to live for the next three years. So my probability is 100% and I expect a 10% raise. So I have $100, right, currently, then I have $110 a year from now, and then $121 a year from now, then $133 a year from now. And then I could keep compounding that out. But what did I say? Let's do it over a three year period. And so that's really only the numerator, really. It's just, you know, how much do I make now? Then how much am I going to make? And how much am I going to make during my remaining working years? It's just a summation of those future expected incomes. Now, of course, we're going to weight it by the probability, and those probabilities are probably pretty high, right? 98%, 97%, something like that. And then we're going to divide by one plus an interest rate. Notice we're going to start with the risk-free rate of interest, and then we're going to add some kind of a risk premium. And that risk premium, of course, has to relate to risk. Now, let me go ahead and recall our conversation that we had back in, in level one. Remember we had those building blocks model where we started with the risk-free rate and we added a liquidity premium, we added an inflation premium, we added a maturity risk premium, we added a default risk premium, we did all that kind of stuff. Well, in this reading, the Institute simplifies it. And so that why, that risk premium associated with income volatility is going to be kind of summation of that building block model that we used a while ago, but uh, I'm certain the Institute would just give you what that risk premium is, 1% or 2% or 10%, whatever that might be. So let's work through a quick example. Here we have Jane, retire in six years, makes $80,000, increased by 3%, risk-free five, low degree occupational risk position, so risk adjustment assessment, her income volatility is 1%. 99% likelihood of surviving the first year. This probability decreases by 1% a year. So this is probably the way you would be presented uh, on the exam. You know, clearly you wouldn't have a 31 year old who's gonna retire in 89 years and you'd have to go back, you know, all those time periods. So it's probably gonna be a relatively short period. So let's get at, at, go ahead and get out our uh, formula here. Here are the variables, the input variables. We can throw them in there. Now we can't just use this formula. Let's go ahead and get out our Excel spreadsheet. All right, so there we go. Years one through six down the first column on the left. And then we're starting with 80,000 and then we're just computing future values, right? 82, 84, 87, all the way up to 95. Let's go ahead and compute the present value of those wages. Now, before we did that, we needed to skip down to the bottom. What kind of an interest rate are we gonna use? We're gonna use 5% risk-free plus that 1%. What do we call that? Uh, yield volatility? Uh, let's not call it yield, let's call it income volatility, right? So there's 6% 
probability of survival, 99, 98, 97, right? That's kind of like the number of bottles of beer on the wall. When, uh, when you sang that song as little kids, driving your parents crazy on the way to vacation. And so there's just a probability weighted. So take the 77, 736 times the 99%, you get that 76, 958. Go ahead and sum all those things and you get, well, what is that? $420,000 or thereabouts. All right, let's continue on this discussion of human capital. What are some issues in estimating human capital? So let's just go back here really quickly. What are some issues inside of this table? In other words, in other words, let me go ahead back to level one. That summation there of 419.785, you know, that's an expected value. That's an average. It's maybe the most likely estimate of human capital. But how can we change it? Of course, we make some different assumptions about growth rates, about income volatility, about probability of survival. So here we have a list of some of these issues. So there's the first one, estimating growth rates. You know, how can you predict what kind of uh, income you're going to get next year, let alone five years from now or 10 years from now? And of course, different occupations grow in their rates very, very differently. I'll just give you just a quick example. You know, generally where I teach, we have around a 2% increase every year. <clears throat> around, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's zero during COVID, but you know, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to do this. Now I have a low risk job, a low standard deviation of my income, you guys, on the other hand, you probably have super high standard deviations. And so, you know, this is difficult to estimate. Uh, yeah, risk-free rates, you know, what can we do? You know, the easiest thing is just to go ahead and say, all right, what's the uh, yield on the one-year treasury security? You know, that's where we'll start with the risk-free rate. And that's probably the most practical and maybe even the most pragmatic way to do it. But we might need to adjust that with some income volatility risk modifications. So th those are difficult to estimate, right? Um, yeah, super hard to predict these mortality risks and disability risks and other risks that are imposed on human capital. So remember I say this regularly, especially in context of the policy statement, that lots of the stuff that we do is a science, right? And, you know, we back here, we did the science, right? There's the math. But then a lot of it is art history. You know, let's go ahead and try to figure out disability risks, mortality risks, what kind of lifestyle do you lead? What kind of car do you drive? Do you ever jump out of airplanes? That kind of stuff. It's an, it's an art to it. Yeah, uncertainty of human capital payments. What does this have almost everything to do? Well, let's go ahead and list some things. Levels of interest rates in the economy, inflation, general employment levels, but essentially what we're saying is that, you know, if the economy expands by, let's say, 5% every year, then you're probably much more likely to be able to predict those human capital payments than if the economy goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then it goes like this, and then like this, right? So uh, uncertainty, loss of human capital in the early life cycle, right? So if you have a disability when you're younger, if you lose your job yet when you're younger, then you don't have all of that of your lifetime to compound out to a larger future value. Yeah, financial capital risks, of course, they increase when it, uh, during the course of the lifetime, but those human capital risks, they fall later in lifetime. You know, just think of it as the opposite of each other. All right, financial capital, I already said this, tangible and intangible assets, personal assets and investment assets. Uh, there's some good boxes there. Notice that these things would probably fall under a general heading of alternative investments, real estate, jewelry, wine, stamps, artwork. Think of uh, some of your favorite people that show up in the movies and on television, uh, car collections, whiskey collections. I'll let you figure out who those people are. 
All right, non-publicly traded assets, so real estate. You know, Now this is apart from the REITs that show up on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, cash value of life insurance, business assets, uh, collectibles. I'll go ahead and repeat this. Maybe you've heard this before. I, I don't know if I said this back in level two or in level three when we talked about uh, these collectibles. Years and years ago, I just came across oddly on eBay the swimming trunks that Daniel Craig wore in that great James Bond movie, Casino Royale, in 2006. And they were selling on eBay for $18,000. And I thought, man, why would anybody spend $18,000 on that? And then, of course, in the context of the policy statement and what the CFA is interested in getting us to understand is that, boy, I could have bought that in 2000, whatever year it was, 2008, 2010 for 18,000. Maybe it's worth 100,000 now that Daniel Craig is no longer making any James Bond movies. I mean, you know, go from 18,000 to 100,000 over 12 years. That's probably better than, uh, than what we did in fixed income or equity securities. Now, here's where we get into something that I think is, is super interesting, and, and this relates to the policy statement. Remember, we have this lifetime portfolio, and then we have this retirement portfolio. So uh, pension assets are gonna be the most significant type of these non-marketable assets. So we either have private employers or governmental organizations, or we can just do this on our own. Now, here's some good definitions because these are really, really good exam questions. So I want you to uh, we're going to focus on the purple and the blue over on the right. But here, I bet you know this here, employee directed savings plan. So what we do is that we get to pick how much we contribute and then we get to pick the investment vehicle. These traditional pension plans, uh, these are called uh, uh, defined benefit plans. So what we do, I don't know, sometimes we might contribute. A lot of times we don't contribute anything. Uh, the employer or the government body, they do all this investing. And then when we retire, they say, we'll pay you $100,000 a year until you die. So here's the ex good exam questions here, the vested <clears throat> versus the unvested. So think about this, benefits already earned, these vested benefits. So these are considered financial capital, and that's important. Look over under unvested. These are contingent on future work. So these are considered as hu human capital. So these are great two potential exam questions in the purple and the blue. Uh, government pensions, these are more secure, mostly because the government has the ability to do stuff that private uh, businesses do not in order to pay. Uh, in fact, there's you know, if you're a regular reader of the Wall Street Journal, which you should be, you know, there's just so many fascinating stories about different states and their pension funds who, uh, who uh, you know, are getting into trouble because they're super, uh, super underfunded. Is that a word? Super underfunded? Maybe. Now, of course, this is a great exam question. They are similar to bonds because when you retire, you're guaranteed these benefits. So what we can do is we can, you know, compute this uh, mortality weighted net present value. Now, the interest rate that we're going to use might be a little bit different than we had in that previous example based on whether we need to include inflation or whether we not we don't. If those numerators include a measure of inflation, in other words, a sentence in the question sem would say, you know, you're going to make $100 this year, and no matter what happens, we're going to add 3% every year to protect you against inflation. So if you do that in the numerator, then you don't have to, uh, then you don't have to count it twice by including it in the denominator. If I were making up an exam question, boy, I would throw that on there. All right, other factors to consider with the interest rate, uh, health of the plan, credit quality, and then any other kinds of stuff that we can come up with. I right, remember when I said this a little while ago about the balance sheet of a business, we have the assets over here and we've got liabilities here and then we have the equity down at the bottom. What does that equity in a business represent? Of course, the ownership of the business. Well, for individuals, we call that economic, uh, economic net worth. So it's financial and human capital minus any of liabilities. 
Boy, look at the illustration that we have over there on the right. This is a perfect picture of these financial stage stages. I'm not sure what that little dude is doing over there in the diaper, but he's probably not worried about his retirement. Neither is the, the striped shirt. I don't know about the dude in the vest. Yeah, but sooner or later, we start worrying about this kind of stuff. So education phase, early career development, peak accumulation. So that one right there, you know, peak accumulation. What would be awesome is that peak accumulation lasts from, you know, I don't know, 35 to 55 years old, probably doesn't last that long, but that would be awesome. Pre-retirement, early retirement, and late retirement. So let's go through these in a little bit more detail. Education phase, so this is when we're in college. This is when we're just uh, trying to figure out what we're doing with our life. So we probably have uh, limited financial capital because we rely on our parents, but we might have lots and lots of human capital. Of course, that that the present value of the human capital depends on what we're doing during the education phase. Are we just slipping by with a 2.1 GPA or are we trying to graduate with, uh, with a 4.0? Those of you who have children who are nearing college age, I'll give you a piece of advice even though you didn't ask for it. You can say this and you can use me as a reference. You know, I have regularly a handful of students every year who graduate with finance degrees and they have 3.92 average. 3.98, 3.88. And these are the people, they don't have trouble getting jobs. It's as simple as that. All right, early career, what are we doing? Lots of life changes. You know, we might find somebody that we want to spend the rest of our lives with. Although I don't think young people, I don't think they get married at the rate that, uh, that we used to back in the old days. But clearly we're going to do things like buy nicer cars. We're probably going to buy homes. We're probably going to do other stuff. Saving for retirement is probably, probably not uh, a priority. Career development, I don't know, 35 to 40, that's taken right out of the handbook. Uh, deeper level of expertise, yeah, career mobility, income growth. What are financial goals? Probably, you know, doing things like, all right, I want to retire someday. Uh, that increases my awareness. But, you know, I have these little people that live in my house and sooner or later they're going to grow up and say, hey, dad, I'd like to go to college. Hey, mom, I'd like to go to a trade school. Hey, dad. Hey, mom, help me out. You know, whatever it is. So uh, saving for children's education. Peak accumulation, 51 to 60. Notice I'm not even in that peak accumulation range there. Yeah, retirement income planning is a focus. Hopefully we have our children. Hopefully they graduate with 3.92s and they get jobs so we don't have to worry about supporting them. Uh, look at the very bottom there. I'll go ahead back to uh, 1966 and the great George Harrison song called The Tax Man. So just remember peak accumulation and George Harrison. All right, pre-retirement, maximize savings for retirement. This is, I know my colleagues at school, whenever they hit a certain age, you know, probably 55 or 60, they start saying, hey, you know what? I, I, I hear there's an account over here where I can max out so I can take some of my income and I can put it over there into some kind of a retirement account. Can you give me some advice on doing that, Jim? I'm like, dude, just go over there. It's really easy to do. Don't uh, uh, bother me with something more important like helping our students. Uh, yeah, look at number two, portfolio reallocation to reduce investment risk. So, you know, you think about this when you're in these earlier stages, you know, you probably have a client who's taking on lots and lots of risk, which means we have lots and lots of a high interest rate. But now what we're going to do is we're going to change from, you know, high beta st stocks, right? Over to low beta stocks and fixed income securities. And then there's George Harrison showing up again. Early retirement, the reading defines this as the first 10 years of retirement. Gosh, I hope I live 10 years after I retire. Significant life change. Yeah, absolutely. I just had lunch with one of my colleagues who retired uh, a year ago, and he was telling me that he's looking for things to do. He says, I may go get another job. I was like, just come back and help me teach my class. Uh, early retirees may have more free time than they're used to. That's what I was saying. Increase expenses. So that's important there we have down in red, 
right? We're not gonna we're not gonna in early retirement take all of our equity and fixed income securities and invest them in treasury bonds, right? We still need we still need partial allocation to equities and partial allocation to triple B rated bonds and partial allocation to collectibles and to real estate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, late retirement, highly unpredictable. All right, so we have to worry about longevity risk, healthcare expenses, uh, cognitive decline. Um, yeah, these are concepts that nobody, nobody likes to talk about. So my father was so good about it. He, he joked and he planned. And so he did us all a great favor um, in, in uh, the later years of his late retirement. Uh, thankfully, he was not in any cognitive decline, but he had these extra health care expenses. And so, you know, my sister and I had to, uh, had to manage this uh, through the later years of his life. All right, so I warned you earlier about we're going to look at the balance sheet. So here we go. Assets, you know, here's stuff that we've talked about, intellectual property, vehicles, collectibles. There are all the loans that we have over on the liability side. But what we can do is we can look at, oh, let me go back here real quickly. So here's this traditional balance sheet that looks a little bit similar to a business's balance sheet, but then let's look at an holistic view where we include stuff from the previous slide, but we also have non-marketable assets. There's, there's our human capital. And we also throw in pensions and, uh, and social security. I hope you guys get these social security statements that I get every year or so. And they say, all right, Jim, you worked a thousand years and here you go. This is what you, uh, this is what you get if you retire when you're 62 or 65 or 85. And it's just not quite what you think it would be, or at least what you would hope it would be. All right, liabilities, they include everything on that previous balance sheet, but then they include things like the cost of living, some kind of future consumption. And bequests and transfers. This was big in my father. My father always said, you know, when I go, I want you and your sister to have as much of my money as possible. He would always tease us that uh, he was eating hot dogs when he went out instead of lobster and steak. And my sister and I would say, you know what, dad, we, we have jobs. <laughs> Please have a steak. All right, how about the importance of the economic balance sheet? Well, you know this from just our previous business balance sheet discussions. So what, what are we saying here? Boy, gives us a good financial account of what we own and what we owe. And so what we're doing here is we're looking at this balance sheet from this entire perspective. And what that allows us to do is to plan better for the future. After all, when the client comes to us and we're crafting the policy statement, it's our job to predict the future. I mean, the client can say something like, you know what? I got these uh, these five kids. They're all seven years old. They're going to go to college in 10 or 12 years. You know, we can plan for that. But at some point, we want to buy a lake house. At some point, we want to take off three months and go over to Iceland and spend three months in the wintertime over there skiing and doing whatever they do in Iceland. We, you know, we want to do this. And so, of course, when we can value, right? This is why we did that net present value earlier. When we can value that human capital, we can say, you know what? You can do this. Here, have a great time. And then when you get back, don't worry about it. We'll figure all this stuff out. Figuring it out is an important concept. Yeah, risk assessment, life cycle planning, surplus or shortfall analysis. This, this has everything to do with what I was saying here about the future planning. So we plan for risk. We plan for different life cycles. You know, we, we say something like, oh, you know what? We're going to be aging, right? Remember that there's a commercial out there for some wealth manager who has a picture of this guy now as a young guy and then it morphs him into a you know a 75 year old guy and they're you know back and forth and they have a conversation and the old dude says boy you should be thinking about this and and the young dude says boy you should be you should be thankful that i'm thinking about this and so it's really a cool commercial about uh, about life cycle planning and then of course we have to ask the question oh what happens if we run into some of these problems that we talked about earlier in this slide about the hazards and about the risks. Are we going to have a surplus? Are we going to have a shortfall? What do we do? I mean, it's awesome if we have a, a surplus, but what happens if we have uh, a shortfall? 
All right, here's a good exam question. Changes in this net worth. So human capital is highest in a person's early career life. All right, so higher potential to earn income, longer work time life, long, longer working over the lifetime. And of course, this decreases with age. And then the um, financial capital is just the opposite. We don't start out with very much money. And then at the end, hopefully we... Uh, uh, hopefully at the end, we have tons and tons of this, but we give it away, right? We, the Institute doesn't want us to be estate attorneys, but they want us to know that our clients should probably not die with any assets that are in his or her name. Um, look at that last diamond point there. I think this is a pretty good exam question. Wealthier individuals may have smaller pension ben benefits compared to their financial capital. Let's do just a quick example of a balance sheet. There we have total assets of 3.25 million and we've got total liabilities of 2.12. So what's the difference there? 1.13 million, there's, there's our economic net worth. It'd be awesome if the Institute gives you a question like this on the exam. It's just a matter of getting out your calculator and adding and subtracting. All right, here's where we get into this kind of concept of insurance planning. So all the stuff that we've done over, what's it been, 30 minutes or so, you know, we're kind of leading up to how do we manage these risks. So look at the uh, LOS, discuss the risks and how they relate to financial capital. So, you know, death, and property, liability, health, all these things, we're going to use insurance planning. And that's why I mentioned that, that you know, two of the men who wrote this article were certified financial planners. And so, you know, remember, there's an entire insurance planning there. So this is all their expertise that's, uh, that's coming uh, through this particular LOS. So what can we do? We can, we can avoid, right? Risk avoidance. That means that, you know, I, this is the example that I used in class this past semester when we were talking about, it was my derivative securities class. And we were talking about how to, how to manage risk. And I say, what is, what's the, what would be the easiest way for the wicked witch of the West not to melt? melt? Always carry an umbrella. If she had an umbrella, she wouldn't have gotten splashed with the water, and she wouldn't have melted. And then who knows what would have happened to Dorothy back in uh, back in the Wizard of Oz? So we can just avoid that kind of uh, of, of a, a behavior or an action. But of course, sometimes you can't avoid it. So what do you do? You can you can retain the risk. You can just walk around without an umbrella, or you can reduce the risk by some kind of other behavior. Maybe you have other, boy, what were those, what were those people called that walked around with the Wicked Witch of the West? I can't even remember. Maybe those people carry an umbrella, so you reduce it, or you can transfer the risk through an insurance contract. Now let's go specifically to uh, earnings risk here. And this is important. I think this is the most likely exam question. So potential loss of, uh, of human capital due to job loss. All right, so what, how, how do we figure out the risk of a job loss? Well, you got to go to the macro level. You start with a macro economy and say, look, if the economy is growing at five or 6%, we're all probably going to be able to keep our jobs. But then you have to squeeze and go down to the industry level, right? And say, all right, what industry are we in? Are we, are we in a growing industry or a non-growth industry? You know, and then we squeeze down to our main competitors in our business and then we look at our particular company what's the financial health so you start big and you squeeze all your way down to the micro level now we can include in that conversation look that down on the left there lack of job opportunities due to an economic recession so this not only has a lot to do with you know the stability of the job but also mobility you know like if we don't like our job you know if i don't like teaching where i am i can I mean, I could go teach somewhere else. I mean, I don't know how many colleges would be willing to hire a 61-year-old uh, finance professor, but maybe one or two. And then health risks, that's uh, obvious. And then inability to find suitable, em suitable employment. Notice down at the bottom, uh, these jobs, of course, can be cyclical depending on the particular industry or sector and, and the economy. Yeah, tourism, hospitality, uh, these are dramatically affected during economic downturns. Um, you know, boy, if you're struggling on the exam for an example or to think of something relevant, just think of COVID. Think of all the people who lost their jobs. 
you know, why, what was that? Was that a health reason or was that an economic reason? Well, it was probably an economic reason because the government shut us all down. And so some of these businesses just, uh, they just went away because the government prevented any demand for that particular product line. Uh, premature death. Yeah, we all, we all should worry about this. This is why we, uh, this is why we use, uh, this is why we use life insurance. You know, so what do we have to worry about? We have to worry about the cost of dying. What's the cost of dying? Things like funeral and burial costs. Um, when my mother died, you know, this is, uh, you know, over 10 years ago, um, we paid, I think it was $485 to have her obituary he published one day in the paper. You know, who would have thought that, uh, that obituary announcements were so expensive, but those are part of the funeral costs. Yeah, so if we have a spouse that dies, we may have to relocate. We have a state settlement. Boy, there's all sorts of taxes out there and you have to pay the lawyers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's why when you die, you should have no assets in your name. Then you have to worry about that stuff. Additional education training for survivors. How about moving on to longevity risk, outliving our financial capital? So then what do we have to worry about? Lifespans, investment returns inflation, other sources of income, you know, lots and lots of uh, uh, retirees, you know, they get other jobs. They go working at a retail store. Uh, they do lots of volunteering and those volunteering uh, opportunities may, may lead to jobs. That's a really uh, good possibility for your clients. Now, how do we quantify this stuff? Well, we can go back to what we learned back in level one, Monte Carlo simulation. So remember that this is just an algorithm. So you have a model and you change each of the inputs by very, very small amounts, random amounts that are generated by the algorithm. And so you have all of these possible scenarios. Maybe you have 100,000 of them. So then you can take means and standard deviations and do value at risk and expected exposure. And you can do all that kind of stuff to quantify uh, this particular type of risk. Now, of course, we can rely on the actuaries for uh, the tables that are gonna tell us when people that, that uh, are similar to me, 61-year-old college professor who uh, walks three to five times a week, eats oatmeal and blueberries for breakfast every day. I mean, they can tell us of a sample of, you know, how many are there people like me with PhDs in finance? I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one that eats oatmeal for breakfast. But anyway, maybe there's a thousand of us and they can say, you know, six of you are going to die this year, 12 of you are going to die the next year. But it's tough to say which one of us is going to be the one that does, uh, that does that dying. And so notice the second teardrop point, we have to adjust for health factors and adding years uh, for life expectancy. Now, this is an interesting possible exam question. Look at that first diamond point up there. This, uh, this longevity risk can influence an individual's decisions regarding their human capital. Hmm, an individual concerned about longevity risk may choose to work longer, and this may have a positive effect, and this may have a negative effect. Boy, positive effect means that, of course, of course, we're going to have uh, more earnings. So we're going to have more human capital, probably a uh, larger retirement. But my gosh, what if we miss out on our grandchildren's volleyball games? What if we miss out when our gr granddaughter, you know, goes to a swim meet and she wins her first swim meet? What about if we can't have a garden? What if we can't go fishing? What if I have to go to work and I can't go over here and do whatever it is? So this is why we, this is why we do the annuities and I'm sure you guys know about this. All right, so let's get into the dullness of, uh, of insurance, house, car, weather related damages, uh, loss of personal items. Um, my sister had a friend who went to the beach and had all of his stuff in his car and he went in to use the restroom somewhere and he came out and everything was gone. So loss of personal items. Of course, that's why we have, uh, that's why we have insurance. Now there are direct losses and indirect losses. I mean, these are obvious ones. I, I, I'd be surprised if the Institute would go ahead and, uh, and put this on the exam, but if it does, it would be just one question. 
direct loss is the financial cost. The indirect loss is any additional expenses. This is why on my, uh, my automobile policy, I have a little sentence in there. I have no idea how much extra I pay for it. A little sentence that says something like, if anybody in my family crashes and totals the car, then we have an allowance of you know $80 a day to, to rent a car. So the, we transfer that risk. Of course, we have to pay for it. Of course, we have to pay for it. That makes sense. Yeah, there are two examples of direct and indirect loss. So, uh, yeah, let's think of property as a financial asset because we put our other wealth, right? What's that term that, you know, money is fungible, all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, you know, so a loss here is going to affect us from doing something over there. Think of that, you know, kind of the context of, a, of an opportunity cost. Yeah. Puts that, uh, yeah, con in this case, business property contributes to future earnings, so it uh, puts human capital at risk. Oh, let me go back there. So property insurance can mitigate property risk. How about liability risk? Back in the old days, I used to have what they call an umbrella policy. So I, I had my car insurance and I had my homeowner's insurance, and then I had an umbrella policy. I forget what that was for, $5 million. And that was because I was worried that one of my children were going to just drive through the McDonald's and crash into the uh, into the building one day. Uh, but then it somehow got uh, what's the right word? There's a there's a term for it subsumed into into my auto policy. But, you know, make sure that your clients are aware of, you know, this kind of general liability because we can do harm to others. We can have property damage. You know, I'm uh, I'm I'm the first one outside to um, uh, shovel or snow blow the snow off of my sidewalk because I'm liable. So when he comes by and slips and uh, breaks their elbow, there's liability insurance at the bottom. So you can have an umbrella policy separate, or it can be a part of other policies. Health risks, I'm guessing you guys know all about this. Co-insurance, co-payments, deductibles. Sometimes the insurer, the employer pays a little bit of it. Sometimes we pay a little bit of however that, uh, however that works. Here are some good slides and illustrations about how these co-payments work and how these deductibles work. You yeah, look at the second arrow point there. Healthcare expenses can, expenses can, can significantly impact financial capital, of course. When we're younger, we're healthier, right? We don't have to worry about these healthcare costs as much, although it does happen, right? It does happen. So we need to be prepared for it. But uh, on average, it's not going to happen. But as we get older, these things, these things start happening. So we have lower discount rates early on. We have higher discount rates uh, later on. So that takes us through the first part of this particular reading. Notice the next one here, types of insurance, life insurance, annuities, fixed income, yeah, blah, blah, yeah, lots and lots of insurance stuff. So I'll do my best to make that uh, as exciting as possible. Um, I'm gonna hold off on asking you to go to the problems at the end of this particular reading because they're really interspersed with all of the different LOSs. They aren't really separated like some, like some readings are. So you don't have any homework assignments now, uh, but after part two, we're going to go and do those problems at the end of the reading. So, hey, thanks for watching. Uh, good luck studying and have a great day.